I don't know if other writers would agree that like it doesn't matter how like horrible you write a character, when someone slags them off, you suddenly get very defensive and you're like, Yeah, but you don't you don't know them. You don't know what she's been through. Yes, hello and welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival. Thanks so much for joining everyone watching along at home and also everyone here in the studio audience. It's really, really nice uh, to be back in front of some, some live human faces. Um, so thanks for joining us. Today's event uh, is part of our Reading Scotland series at this year's Edinburgh International Book Festival. And this has been a really innovative project which has seen us pair Scottish writers with filmmakers to produce new films that respond to the works that they have produced um, collaboratively between both author and filmmaker. Um, and we're really, really thankful for the support of Sir Ewan and Lady Brown for helping us make this possible, as well as the Scottish Government's Edinburgh Festival's Expo Fund. Um, so if you give a big round of applause to them for, for making this possible, that would be great. So on to today's event, and you'll notice that Ross is not physically here with me on stage. Um, you, you will see that I will be looking down here. I can see Ross on some monitors here. I'm not just ignoring his face up behind me here, but um, we're delighted to be joined by Ross Sayers. <laughs> yeah, who promised to loom over me. <laughs> um, we're delighted to be joined by Ross Sayers, the, the author of this wonderful new novel, Daisy on the Outer Line. Um, I'm afraid to say that one of our guests is not able to join us today. That was Laura Lovemore, the actress in the, in the film that we will be showing today. Um, she, like Ross, uh, is suffering from COVID at the moment and is at the, not well enough to appear uh, in today's event. So I'm really sorry we won't be joined by her. But we do, thankfully, have the film's director, Neve McEwen, who is going to join us on stage after the, the film has premiered uh, a little bit later on. And so just on that format-wise, I'm going to have uh, a bit of a chat with Ross for 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, then we'll show the film, which I, I cannot wait for everyone to see. It's a really, really remarkable piece. Um, I think you're all going to really enjoy it. Um, and then I'll bring Neve up on stage and we'll continue having a chat. And for the last sort of 10 to 15 minutes, we'll take some, some audience questions, both from you guys here in the studio and to our online audience. So if you're watching along at home, you can use the, the Q&A box that should be just underneath the, the video player or just to the right of the video player. Post your questions in there. They'll all come to me on this little tablet, which you'll see me reaching for later, and I can ask them to Ross and Neve. Um, and for you guys here in the studio, it'd be great if you think up some questions, be prepared to raise your hands later on, uh, and we'll come to you. Um, there'll be a microphone and a camera, and it'll all be very smooth and nice. Um, so thanks again for joining. Today, Ross is going to talk to us about Daisy on the Outer Line. Ross is a young adult fiction writer, originally from Stirling, now living in Glasgow. Um, his previous novels include uh, 2017's Mary's The Name, uh, which was shortlisted for the Saltire First Book of the Year Award, a really prestigious uh, and valuable award for uh, Scottish writers. Um, and as, as well as that, he put out 2019's Sunny and Me, which I hope many of you have read. Both of those books explore the themes of friendship and family and the, the difficulty and the, I guess the joy of growing up in Scotland today, uh, quite contemporary novels as well. And all of that comes uh, really clearly into Daisy on the Outer Line, which I think uh, it takes those themes and runs with them and adds a bit of magic as well. Um, this book was published in November last year, November 2020, and, and I might ask you in a minute, Ross, about uh, what that year has, <laughs> has been like. Um, but today, as I say, we're also joined by Neve McEwen, who will come up on stage in a little bit. Uh, she is a screenwriter and director, originally from Dumfries and Galloway, but now based here in Edinburgh. Um, her work, in her own words, and I would never say this myself, uh, focuses on comedic stories about wild, angry women who challenge traditional ideas of womanhood. Um, and I think that this book and this film really key into that. And as I say, we were supposed to be joined by Laura Lovemore, uh, a young actress, and very much, I think, we all agree, the next big thing in, in Scottish acting. Uh, she is a, a recent graduate of the New College in Lanarkshire and has appeared in 
plays and TV shows and on radio. She starred in the National Theatre of Scotland's adaptation of Jenny Fagan's The Panopticon, which was a, a fantastic piece, uh, and also appeared in BBC Radio's Rebus adaptation. So if you give all of our guests a big round of applause just now, that would be fantastic. <laughs> So, Ross, welcome. Hello. How are you doing? Thank you very much. That that um, introduction, that was incredible. Make me sound pretty good. I like to read <laughs> that guy's books. Um, no, thanks so much for, for having me. Obviously, I'm, uh, I apologise. I can't be there in person. Um, well, I'm pretty sure we sold... I'm pretty sure we hadn't sold any tickets until it was announced I wouldn't be there in person. Um, <laughs> but uh, thanks so much for, for, for uh, attending, for coming, everyone. I think there are people there anyway. I haven't really seen, can't really see. <laughs> I can hear. Yeah, they, they definitely are. Um, how, how are you just now? Obviously, you, you had to pull out of the, appearing physically because of COVID. Are you feeling okay? Yeah, not bad. Um, can't really taste much um, or smell much, which has its upsides. Um, but yeah, no, I'm feeling okay. Um, and yeah, just guy I couldn't, I couldn't be there uh, in person, but... Um, yeah, not bad. And obviously, um, it was really sad news about uh, Laura. So I'm just hopefully she's uh, she's feeling okay. Yeah, I think if she's watching along at home, yeah, we'd all like to, to wish her well. Tell me just very quickly before we get going properly, what was the experience like of launching this book in the pandemic? What, is, what has the last year been like for you as a writer? We've been asking a lot of different authors this question during the festival. How has it been? Have you been able to write? What, how has this process been for you across the last 18 months and particularly launching a new novel? Um, I guess it it wasn't too different in that I don't tend to do you know I'm not really that you know well known um, so I don't tend to do like big bookshop tours or that kind of thing um, so really it was just instead of having a, a physical launch we had a like a virtual launch for the book um, and the uh, one thing I think is kind of tricky when you write young adult is that obviously you you're, you're you're mainly writing for, um, for for young adults, for teenagers, and teenagers are probably not the the best at you know getting in touch and giving you feedback, um, which is you know probably for the best. I don't really I don't really want teenagers kind of sliding them my DMs or anything like that. But <laughs> um, especially when you can't like visit schools or anything like that, you sort of you put a book out for teenagers and then you just kind of hope that they find it and hope that they enjoy it and um yeah a lot of time you don't actually get much feedback from them because as much as you know I, I really appreciate um you know grown-ups saying they, they enjoy the book obviously I'd love to hear that maybe some some uh, some folk in like high schools have enjoyed it and uh, yeah they're not the you know not to stereotype but teenagers maybe aren't the best at you know um getting out their feelings and getting in touch with authors, so sometimes I have to rely on like word of mouth or, or if like a like a school librarian, you know, on the off chance they say to me, oh by the way, you know, your books, people enjoying your book, which is obviously <laughs> lovely to hear. But yeah, sometimes it does feel like you just kind of release the book out, and then you just don't really hear much back. Um, you just have to trust that um, everyone absolutely loves it, which I just I just naturally assume. <laughs> well, it's, it's probably the safest thing, isn't it? Um, well, hopefully we'll, we'll get a bit of that feedback today as well. Um, so Daisy on the Outer Line is a story of um, essentially about coming to terms with who Daisy is, who, sh who she is as a person, what the trajectory of her life is going to be. I, I found it particularly um, touching and moving because it felt to me like it explored a point of, a, of the character's life that possibly in, in young adult fiction and also in quote-unquote adult fiction, is quite often ignored. I think we get a lot about being at school and we get a lot about being quite young, but that period sort of... So D Daisy's 19, for anyone who hasn't read the book yet, and that period, to me, is a tricky period where you're sort of cast adrift between childhood and adulthood, and I think that that's got a lot to do with what's going on with Daisy. Um, but yeah, it's kind of about understanding where she is there and how she can become the adult that she sort of needs to be. Is that fair to say? How, how would you kind of introduce the book to someone? 
Yeah, no, I think it is, and I think you're right. I, th- I do think there is maybe like a bit of a gap um, in the market there, which, you know, obviously I'm going to try and fill, and I hope no one else writes these kind of books <laughs> so I can have it to myself. Um, yeah, because like technically, if you write something with a narrator is like over, it's like left high school, essentially, you know, it, it, it counts as new adult. So it's like, I think like Sally Rooney's books um, kind of fall into that category. Um People are always comparing me and Sally Rooney. I wish they'd stop. Um, I think the the thing is that I think yeah, people will think that kids in high school only want to read about like people that are like sixteen. But I think they want to read higher. You know, like when you're in high school, all you want to do is read what you're not supposed to read and read above. Um, like you know, when you turn fifteen. You don't just want to read 15 certificate, uh, watch 15 films. You want to watch 18 films. Yeah. So like, if you're in high school and you're told, right, this is, these are the books for you. These are the characters at your age. Or you know, you want all you, all you want to do is see what comes next. Um. So you know, you you you're not just happy. You're not content just sitting where you are. You want to see what's coming next in your life. So yeah, I'm hopefully um, hopefully this gives them a bit of a a peek at how. A terrible life becomes after high school. <laughs> yeah, it never, never really ends, does it? Um, <laughs> so I, I think you're, you're going to give us a reading from the book. Um, maybe we should do that now, and then we'll have a bit of chat before we get to see the, I guess, the world premiere of Fleurs, which I'm really excited to share with everyone. Uh, are, you, are you good to go for a, a reading just now? Yep, yep. Um, so this is um, Daisy. This is before... Um, Spoiler, she goes back in time. Um, she is on a Christmas night out with her two best friends, uh, Francis and Sam. Uh, so she works she works at Boots uh, on Sokey Hall Street, and this is their Christmas night out um, at the pub, basically. <clears throat> so basically, we shouldn't be debating if Die Hard's a Christmas film. How many times do we need to argue about it? It's the same thing every year, born. Let's move on to a mere imp- important question. Is It's a Wonderful Life, a fantasy film. Francis looks at me for a response. I've not been properly listening. When she starts up in one of her rants, I usually just zone out until it's my turn to speak and hope she didn't end with a question. And it's only me and her at the table right now, so it's not like I can wait for somebody else to save me. Sam's away at the toilet, and I'm fairly sure the rest of them aren't coming back to the cash machine. What was that? I asked. Die Hard. Aye, uh, aye, Die Hard's good. Alan Rickman with that beard, he's quite fit. Francis shakes her head and takes a sip of Heineken. Only you by Yuzu pulses through the pub. Would you give up your V-card for Alan Rickman? Francis asks. Um, I thought we agreed we would never discuss the V-card situation in public, I tell her. Can't it, it's just us. Or Sam, anyway. He's in the loo, I say. He's too nervous for the urinal's mind. He'll be ages waiting on the stall. What about the rest? Uh, they went to get cash out about an hour ago, so I'm thinking they've patched us a belter. Think it's because of your chat? They've got a cheek judging of Patter when Marianne still quotes Ace Ventura on a daily basis. It's absolutely heaving in the pub. I've not been in here before. Funny how you end up going for your Christmas night out in a place where none of these would normally go. I open my notes app and start typing on my phone. Friday, 22nd December. Went to Stephen's funeral. All went okay. Boots Christmas night out in Jackson's followed, to be concluded. Francis looks bored sitting across the table for me. I feel rude being on my phone, but there's none stopping her for getting hers out. I save the note, then put my phone down. Who organises a Christmas night out this close to Christmas anyway, I ask. It's Hoshin in here. Last year we had it in January, Francis says. Tight bastards. I get a wee wafty pish every time the toilet door swings open. Some folk have families to travel home to at Christmas. Fair enough, no me, but normal folk. Most of the Boots crew have the huge families, like in Home Alone and open their presents in their house coats with cups of cocoa and wee marshmallows and somebody stream it on Facebook for absolutely no cunt to watch. What are you for Christmas? I ask Frances. My sister's, she says. She's cooking a vegan turkey and my dad's already fuming. He's going to choke himself to death on purpose just to make a point. What about you? Mum did want me to come home for Christmas dinner, but then Stephen died and she didn't bring it up again, so I think I'm in the clear. My auntie Jean will be around the house on the day anyway, so she'll not be on her own. I'm planning to sleep the entire day, I say. Nay, turkey. Perhaps of the dinosaur variety, with a light Heinz ketchup relish. Sam arrives back at the table. His horns are still wet. 
He slides the coaster off the top of his pint and starts flipping cash it off the table ledge. Sam, Francis says, is Die Hard a Christmas film? Sam taps the coaster against his forehead and Mariah Carey comes on the speakers. All she wants for Christmas is a human being. That's quite the demand when you think about it. Most folk are happy with a Furby. Honestly, who cares, Sam says. That Bruce Willis is a fud. <laughs> Me, Sam and Francis stay the lights on Saturdays together most weeks and I'd have went to Lally without them. I'm opening the shop the more and more than though. A Christmas present for the management. Ah, uh, he doesn't exactly have the everyman quality anymore, Francis says. So, are you saying Bruce Willis turning out to be a bit of a fud later in life retroactively affects your enjoyment of Die Hard? I'll leave them to their conversation and start the short trip to the bar. Bodies huddling groups in every possible space. I feel roasting just looking at the folk in Christmas jumpers. Excuse me, sorry, I say, weaving through, somehow managing not to put my horn on anybody's lower backs. Men, take note. Sorry, excuse me. I reach the bar. Hello, I say, trying to get the attention of the staff. Merry Christmas. A guy next to me leans down and shouts in my ear. And to you, I say back. He's probably going to get inappropriate within a few seconds, but I always like to give the benefit of the doubt. It's Christmas after all. Are you on a night out? He asks. No, I'm having a quiet night in. Thank you very much. Thanks for that, Ross. Yeah, you can see quite clearly there, Daisy is a, a really witty, sort of sardonic character, quite a difficult character at the start of the book. I wanted to ask you about that. How, how did you go about writing from the experience of a 19-year-old girl? You know, it's, it's not your experience, obviously. What did you have to kind of do to get into that headspace and make it feel as authentic as it, as it really does? I wish I had a good answer for that. Um, I suppose I just kind of maybe based it on some of the, the things that I see online. Um, that sounds a bit dodgy. Um, <laughs> like the people that I follow on, on Twitter, um, maybe and like on, on social media. Um, obviously, not to not to like compare, um, like me to him, but obviously I know that like. Um, when Bo Burnham made the film Eighth Grade, he like watched a lot of um, like teenage girls like vlogging um, on YouTube, and so I guess my experience was kind of like that, and kind of just like like the the, the sort of the, the younger women that I follow on Twitter, seeing what they kind of post and what they post about after they've been on nights out and that kind of thing. Um, and it's funny, like <clears throat> I don't know if if it's maybe just the way the world changed, but I, I do remember my mum was like. She was like, well, she's quite like different. This this Daisy, you know, she drinks pints, and I'm like, Mum, <laughs> just just shows you the how the world's changed. I'm like, Mum, <laughs> everybody drinks pints these days, you know. It's not like it's not like that. It's like the signifier of like a tomboy or anything like that. But um, yeah, so I guess just based it on maybe just what I what I see on social media and what I kind of and people that I know, and then and obviously um showing it, giving the book to, to women that I know and, and, and younger women and just saying, listen, does this, does this track? And um, if there's anything that, that doesn't, they'll, they're usually quite good at, at telling me that I'm talking a lot of rubbish. <laughs> uh, and I'm quite, I, I was quite taken while reading the book that I, I think a lot of our literary examples of Glasgow and, and even of Scotland and of youth, um, they tend to be from male perspectives a lot of the time. I mean, you think about uh, Irvin Welsh's novels, or you think about James Kelman, or you think about Alistair Gray, you know, it's often these male perspectives on Glasgow uh, and on Scotland. Were you conscious of writing a, a book that is about being a young woman in today's Scotland uh, and, and kind of given an example of that experience uh, different to, to what we often see? Um, I guess, I guess yes and no. I suppose it, that's the kind of thing that, that, that maybe comes out of it. Um, but like, I would never want to say that. Oh, I'm going to I'm going to write the defining, <laughs> the defining book on what it is to be a young woman in, in Scotland in 20, 2020 or twenty twenty one. Like, I don't think that's really for me to do. Um, it just so happened that I just thought this character would work for the for the plot. Because um, essentially, the, the plot was the, the first thing I, I came up with that, um, like the, the the time travel stuff um, and. Because when I'm writing a book, I tend to go for the plot first, and then and then the character comes, and then generally like, the, the themes are sort of what 
what kind of come up naturally while I'm writing it. Um, so yeah, like obviously, I, I hope that I've done a, a, a decent job, but it, I definitely don't think it's it's you know um, uh, for me to say like <laughs> this is this is this is this is what we're going through. I think they can probably do that um, better than I can. I guess um, Glasgow itself is, is almost a character within the novel. Uh, I'm sort of intrigued as to why you landed on Glasgow. You've not always written about there. And also, I mean, you've mentioned yourself, there's time travel within this book. There's the odd device by which that happens is the Glasgow underground, the, the subway. How, how did that come about? It feels to me the amount of time that I've sat on that train and felt deeply uncreative. How did you end up creating this this whole construct out of that? I suppose it was, I think I was still living in Stirling when I wrote the first couple of books. Um, and yeah, when it tends to be, I mean, maybe my imagination just isn't great, but if I'm living somewhere, I'll tend to just Think I'll just I'll just set the book I'll just set the book that I'm writing here. Um, don't have to go too far uh, for research. Um, yeah, so it was I used to work at the at the passport office, um, and I would get off at Kirkcaldy Station, um, and it was I just always thought it was quite a quite a spooky one. And I uh, yeah I, I think I, I the first time I thought of an idea I was like well it'd be you know you could it's pretty creepy down here you could probably get like a a horror story written or something, but I'm not really a, a horror person, and um, I've always loved time travel. And yeah, once once I came up with the idea of, of like, oh, what if you went back in time on the on the, the Glasgow subway, and obviously, like I say, I'm not really one for for research, so I wasn't going to have her go back to like you know too far back, because um, you know I would have to like go to the library and read extra books and stuff. Um, <laughs> so 16 16 days that was enough for me. Um, yeah, and then once I had the idea, I was really quite wasn't about it. I think a lot of writers will probably say that um, like you know you've got a good idea when you're really when you like, you can't you can't really think about anything else and you you like you really just want to get it down because the whole time I was writing it I was thinking God if someone else writes this book before me I'll I'll not be happy. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I got it. I got it out before anyone else could. I think um, like, no one else has written about time travel before. Don't think. Um, so. <laughs> But yeah, I was I was just once I once I came up with that idea because it was quite a yeah I mean obviously quite a few of the, the subway stops can be quite weird, but Kirkcaldy Station at night um, is quite is quite spooky and um, yeah that's where um, Daisy like uh, uh, that's <coughs> where she goes back in time for the first time. So. Yeah. I mean, it certainly can feel like you're travelling back in time on the on the Glasgow subway, in my experience. But um, yeah, it felt like a really novel approach to doing a time travel story. I thought, you know, it's not a DeLorean, it's not some uh, Deus Ex Machina. It's uh, something that we all kind of experience and and have used, but turned into this slightly kind of magical inversion. Anyway, I'm conscious that time is ticking on, and I really want to show this film, this fantastic film that you and Neve and Laura and, and others have put together. Um, so I think we can basically go for that now and we will uh, be back in a few minutes with uh, Neve on stage and to continue the conversation. But for now, please enjoy the, I guess, world premiere of Fleurs. My name's Daisy. What's yours? Go on, say it. Say it. Nobody's gonna judge you. Go on. Don't be embarrassed, don't be shy, say it. Go on, say it. Ha, shite bag. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you a wee story about a young woman who looks like me same age as me, but is definitely no me. And her actions 
To be honest with you, it disgusts me. So our Rose's day started out like any other Wednesday in therapy. For whatever reason, she decided to call her therapist a cunt. Her therapist says, pardon? Rose says, nothing. Her therapist says, you've got an attitude problem. And Rose is thinking, did I ask for your opinion? Then her therapist starts going on about how she drinks too much, jokes around too much, basically implying she's an unlovable piece of shit. So Rose storms out of there, goes to the bathroom to wait in. Boom. That's because she was hungover from her night out the night before. Obviously. So Rose went out with pals Francis and Sam. She had four Southern Comforts and Cokes at the Union, three pints of tenants at the Art, and a pint and a half of Venom at the Cali. And then nothing. She couldn't remember. It's almost as if she drinks past the point of these people would, because she doesn't want to remember. Anyways, she woke up in her usual fashion, clothes crumpled down at the bottom of the bed, phone down at the side of the bed, and the smell of dawn meat coming from somewhere. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, at least she didn't go home with some random. But then he tell her, I'll tell you this, she's actually never. <laughs> and I know you'll say, oh, there's nothing to be embarrassed about. But come on, it is. <laughs> nah, you've got folk on the internet that are like, yes, queen, go at your own pace. <laughs> but in the real world, where all your pals have been shagging for years, you're all sitting at a gaff, they exchange your sex stories, and you're just like, does anyone want to talk about their drink? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she wants to. Look, I, I, I don't think she's got an urge to. Look, she's been on dates and that. But she doesn't feel like she's missing out. I think she's starting to think she's asexual or something. <laughs> Yay! So when Rose got up, she checked her phone and saw the usual text messages from Francis and Sam asking where she was. She checked her Uber and there was a journey at 2.13 in the morning and her rating had went down to 3.83. So obviously she was worried in case there was a cut off where Uber wouldn't pick her up anymore. Half the taxis had blocked her number. <laughs> She'd waited in the back of a taxi, opened the car door while it was still moving, and reached over to the glass <laughs> to change the register. Three strike policy, yeah. <laughs> so uh, Rose did her usual clean up operation, sent a half arsed apology to Francis, saying sorry for being a total mess copied and pasted it and sent the exact same to Sam as well. If you were to search sorry on WhatsApp, it would come up about twice a week in the chat with Francis and Sam. Rose apologises, 
Let's say need to worry about it, it's fine, it's no big deal. Everybody moves on. But do they really? No, Rose pretends to. Hold on. Hello. I, yeah, no, I, I won't be in the day. Okay, I've got that um, winter bug. Aye, uh, like vomiting. Diarrhea is pure carnage. Ah. Uh -huh. Right, name one time I've called in sick. Right, okay, we'll name two times I've called in sick. Aye, uh, that does add, add up, actually. No, right, wait. Name three times I've called in sick within two weeks in a six month period. Ah. Uh -huh. Ah, uh, that's what I thought. Right, ta. Cheers. Bye. I, um, Rose pretends like, doesn't it bother? But it does. It's in her mind. She says to herself that she won't lose control, she'll get their trust back. She knows Francis and Sam talk about her behind her back. She knows I'll deny it. She knows that they wouldn't mind if she just disappeared for good. Did one of her famous exits on a night. They wake up. Check the phones, see that Police Scotland have put out a tweet. Aye, they'll retweet it. But are they going to put flyers out? Do everything that they can? Rose. She's some laugh. She's really not worth the effort, is she? got an appointment. You can come if you want. So I, that's the end of the story. Not much of an ending though, has it? Never said. The reason why Rose was out steaming last night is because her stepfather died. They had a shit relationship. She wishes she could fix it, but she can't. So she's stuck. So she went and got wasted. As usual. Feels like it's the only thing she can do. And how do you feel about that? Eh, uh, fine. I feel like you aren't being honest with me, Daisy. <laughs> I feel like you need to keep your nose out of my business. I feel like that's my job. I feel like you've got a hack at haircut. I feel like you need to go in your salon. I feel like you're using my hair as a deflection. Oh, I feel like I don't want to be here anymore. Suicidal thoughts. Oh, not like that. I mean, I don't see you anymore. Use your inside voice, please. Thanks for everything, Siobhan. Dr Livingston. Aye, Dr Livingston, cunt. Pardon? Nothing. <coughs> My name is Daisy. What's yours?
Superb, and thanks for joining us on stage now, Neve. How are you doing? Good, thank you so much for having me. It's nice to be outside. How was that to see it on the big screen here? Really bizarre, really strange. <laughs> um, I was definitely looking for mistakes, but it, it all feels like it works. It all feels like it works. It's good to see it with people as well. So thank you so much for coming. Um, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the creative process between yourself and Ross, and, and Ross do pitch in here as well. How did the collaboration come about and how did you work together to turn uh, to turn this book, this whole novel, into a 10-minute piece, which I think really captures particularly who Daisy is at the start of the novel, bef before the time travel and the, and the kind of magic elements that allow her to go on her personal journey. What we're seeing here is the selfish, the childish Daisy, but also the, the troubled Daisy and the, the one who's finding life and reality quite difficult. How, how did you go about making that? Um, big question, big, big six week question. I think um, so um, White Stag Films got in touch and just said that they had this project with you guys and um, uh, that had been paired with Ross. Um, so we had a Zoom like this um, on a slightly smaller screen <laughs> um, and we just chatted a bit about the book. I read the book and I thought as a reader what I was most interested in was Daisy as a character. I think I really could relate to her a lot more than I want to admit and um, could definitely see my friends in her and see elements of other people that I knew in her and um, and as a filmmaker I thought you know to make a short um, you want to uh, be as concise as possible like I think we could have definitely made a huge amazing uh, plot twisty time travel film but I think to fit that in 10 minutes would have done the book a disservice um, so for me as a filmmaker I wanted to concentrate on Daisy as a character um, and essentially do a character study um, and yeah, and then we kind of zoomed, talked about that, and then um, talked about co-writing and how that was going to work and how involved Ross wanted to be. And um, Ross uh, went away and wrote a monologue, which a lot of it is as is in the film. Um, and then I took the monologue, chopped it up, switched it around, and then made it into the kind of close-up system that's there, and then added different elements and stuff like this. Um, yeah, that's how it kind of started, I suppose. I mean, obviously, my version is probably different <laughs> than what Ross wants to say, but... Yeah, Ross, how did you find this experience? I, I, I don't think any of your work has been adapted for a screen before. Tell me if I'm wrong, but uh, for you, how, how is it to see it come to life like that? And also, yeah, what, what was your involvement in the, in the writing process? Tell us a little bit more about the difference between writing a novel and writing, uh, as Neve was saying, a kind of monologue to, to be turned into a film. Yeah, um, I agree with everything Neve said. Um, although, f from my point of view, I was actually sort of approached a little bit earlier and um, I was given like a few different filmmakers and um, works as examples and it was like I sort of picked Neve because I thought her work her previous uh, short films kind of spoke to me the most and I thought she would be um, best suited uh, for this um, it was yeah it was it was a tricky one because it wasn't um, obviously it's not it's not like a trailer and it's not like a direct adaptation of anyone seen in the book. So I was a little bit um, uh, worried because I, I, I didn't, because mostly when I write something, you know, I'll start off with a plot and obviously with short films, the plot's sort of not as important. So, um, but yeah, it was neither suggested that it should be a monologue and, and that kind of opened the door for me and, and yeah, she like guided me through it really and made sh like, because I think the monologue I'd written was sort of, it was, I think it was okay, but obviously she, Neve knows like how to make it look good in screen and, and what we can do and what we can't do and that kind of thing. So um, Neve kind of held my hand to the whole process. So uh, I was just really thankful to get to work with her and I, I'm just really delighted with, with how it's all turned out. Fantastic, yeah. I think we were totally stunned when we first saw it and I think the, the reaction in the room here was, was really positive as well. Um, I wanted to, to ask Laura, had she been here, about that process of inhabiting a character like Daisy who is, who is complex and who is, is difficult to like, I think it's fair to say, at the start of the book, um, but you see in her performance some of that sensitivity and some of that, the, the kind of truth of what's going on with her there. What was that like to, to direct? Yeah, I mean, I really don't think I can take credit. I really think like 99% of that was absolutely Laura. And it was me being like, can you move your hand faster? <laughs> or like really annoying kind of directions. Um, but I suppose me and Laura, um, very, as soon as we had kind of um, uh, got her on board the project, we had a little Zoom as, as life is. And then um, 
I sent her the scripts, kind of some mood boards kind of spoke her through the feeling that I wanted to go for and then we met for um, like a little coffee and went through the script. But I think what was quite interesting was what Daisy says versus what she means, um, what, what, I don't know, it's kind of that, there's elements within this, especially the scene when she's outside smoking, it's, it's like a three and a half minute scene and the kind of beats that Laura has to hit are like insane, but she absolutely, I think we had 17 takes and she always like hit the mark. Um, but I think it was like trying to find elements of she's trying to be funny and she, she wants the audience to be on her side and she really is fond of the audience by the end. That's why she invites us along to her therapist's office and it's just that moment when we pull back and she's kind of just shooting herself in the foot and we just, we know we can't help and we're stepping away and um, I think there's elements of the script that, or performance that she's kind of discovering, discovering, discovering and then something happens like a phone rings or the therapist comes in and it kind of stunts uh, her progress in herself and I suppose it's a really bittersweet, sad, like I feel really sad watching it. It makes me feel sad but um, no, Laura's like amazing and I really, I don't know how she does it. She's like so good, yeah, so, so good. Really, really good. Um, Ross, I wanted to ask you as well, cinema itself feels to me like a, quite a major influence on the book or, or it, it's, it's mentioned a lot, there's a lot of cultural references throughout the novel um, and, and particularly I suppose things like It's a Wonderful Life as you, as you kind of mentioned in the reading, um, a bit of Sliding Doors, a bit of Freaky Friday, um, maybe even a bit of The Wizard of Oz in there in terms of the journey that the character goes on. How big an influence for you was film and, and is it weird or interesting to now be turning it into film itself? Um, yeah, I think film has been a, a big influence on me and like, uh, yeah, I, I think it's easier just to um, to directly say which which ones. So like, in the book, I obviously bring up It's a Wonderful Life and Back to the Future because it makes it feel like if I'm the one saying it, then no one can be like, oh, he's ripping off, he's ripping <laughs> off X and Y. I'd be like, yeah, I know I'm rip uh, like, oh no, it's a, it's a, it's a, they're my influences, I'm not ripping them off. Um, so yeah, and yeah, no, it's just it's it's like a, it's pretty much a dream come true um, to see something you've written up on the up on the up on the big screen. Obviously, I can't, I didn't get to see it on the big screen, but I'm assuming it was I'm assuming it was absolutely fantastic because I always say I know it was fantastic. Um, and yeah, I just uh, I've just been incredibly lucky um, in like every step along the way. Um, obviously, for to even be offered that, and then obviously to get to work with with Neve, and then and then. Uh, for Laura to be to be our Daisy, um, I don't think I'm going to be able to picture anyone else in that. Not that I not that I ever read my own books back, but um, <laughs> uh, that would be torture. But um, you know, any time there where I'm doing a reading or anything, I'm probably I'm probably going to picture Laura in that role. I think. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It does feel like she inhabits that character for me now after after having seen it. Um, I'm going to come on to audience questions in just a minute or two. So if you are sitting in, in the studio audience or uh, online at home, think about what you want to ask um, and, and do fire some into the, the Q&A. Um, but quickly, Neve, you, you've set the film, as I say, quite kind of at the beginning of the story. Um, it, it, it does gather in a lot of the scenes from the beginning of the novel um, bef before Daisy's journey literally and figuratively begins. Was there no temptation for you to make a time travel movie to do your own sort of Glasgow set back to the future? Um, I think there was. I mean, I think if it, genuinely, if we were like, go and make a 90 minute film, honestly, I absolutely would have done that. <laughs> but I just think from just making shorts for so long, I kind of know that the simplest idea that you go for, the better in a way. And like I said earlier, it would have absolutely kind of I think if I had tried to do that, it would have been terrible. Like, it really would have been awful. Um, but I mean, in some ways, like, I think my, like, to follow my own sword, my major regret is that we didn't shoot it in Glasgow or we're not on the subway. So I'm really sorry if anybody <laughs> came for that. But it's funny shameful because. Shameful admission. <laughs> it's shameful, but I have to say it because the first time that me and Ross met, I was like, you know, they're going to try and push, push us to shoot in Edinburgh and shoot elsewhere, but I'm going to do absolutely everything in my power that we're going to get on the subway. And I promise you, I promise you everything. And then, like, two Zooms later, I was like, the thing is, here's the thing. <laughs> We can't do it, so, um, but it's I shouldn't have said anything. Either. Maybe people wouldn't have known, <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, but yeah, um, maybe maybe for the future film we can do that. But um, no, I just think for, for even people that I worked with, you know, um, we've got musician and costume in the audience. And um, I always said that all you need to do is read the first three pages of the book and you absolutely get an essence of the character and the world. Like if you don't have time to read the full thing now, 
literally read the first chapter and then you'll understand it. And I think I really wanted to make a film that people could watch not having read the book and get the film, but also people who have read the book to watch it and be like, oh, I get the essence of um, the idea. So, yeah. But it ha has been so much fun. Like, it's definitely been one of the best collaborations I've ever had. It was like, it was very stressful, but like stressful in like a busy way, not stressful in a like, um, clashy way, <laughs> that makes sense. So it was really, it was really great to work with, Ro with Ross and you guys and everyone. Yeah, really backstage they wouldn't speak to one another yeah, on the Zoom. Didn't. It's a really <laughs> tense situation. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'd like to see if anyone in the studio audience has any questions for us at this point. Um, and I've got a couple coming in online as well. So um, raise your hands if you would like to ask anything at all, either to Ross or to Neve. Yeah, we've got one just here. Um, if we take that first and then I'll come to the, the online questions. Go ahead. Hi, Ross. You talked a bit about how the um, plot came first and then the characters and then the themes. I'm interested to know if you knew what was going to happen to Daisy when you started or whether that, that sort of developed as you were writing. That's a good question. I think I... Let's just think. Did I know what was going to happen to Daisy? What happens to, what happens to Daisy again? <laughs> um, no, I think I, I think I did. I think I, this was one where I had a rough, because uh, going into each book, sometimes I know the ending and sometimes I don't. I think with this one, because I was, you know, um, uh, heavily borrowing, let's say, from such films as It's Wonderful Life, I kind of knew that I was going for the happy ending or happy-ish ending. Um, so I knew she was going to, you know, get back. <coughs> I knew she was going to get back to you know her own timeline and her own body. Um, I guess it's, these are spoilers, but I'm, I, yeah, you should have, you should have read it by now. You should have read at least the first three pages. Um, yeah, so I think I, I think I knew that I wanted, and 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 like's been said, like obviously she's quite unlikable at the start, and I knew that I wanted her to be somewhat likable, hopefully at the end. Um, so I kind of knew that I needed to, her to go through that sort of redemption arc. Um, and yeah, so one of the good things about writing a time travel book is that when you finish it, when you finish the draft, you can go back and, and, and fix the start, essentially. So obviously there's a lot of bits and pieces that are referenced at the start that then hopefully pay off later in the book, um, which make me hopefully look a bit clever, but obviously I'm not. I just, <laughs> I didn't know they were going to be in there in the first draft. I just went back and popped them in. Um, so yeah, I think I knew that because I knew I was starting off with her being so unlikable. Um, I knew that I needed her to be likable by then, so I needed her to, to go through that redemption shark and sort of, and, um, and get back. Um, and it, although it's funny, um, I remember my publisher, Kranikin, when I showed them the first draft, um, even though I knew that Daisy was unlikable, when they came back with like the feedback and they said, oh yeah, Daisy, she's really unlikable, wasn't she? I suddenly got really defensive and I was like, what? She's not that like, what? like, you know? And I was like, how dare you say that about Daisy? So I, I think she actually was even more unlikable in the first draft and I had to sort of try and lighten it up a bit because it uh, um, doesn't matter how, but I, I think, I don't know if other writers would agree that like, it doesn't matter how like horrible you write a character, when someone slags them off, you suddenly get very defensive and you're like, yeah, but you don't, you don't know them. You don't know what she's been through. Um, so it was, yeah, it was quite defensive about her. I don't know if I've totally went off on a tangent. I don't know if I can answer the question, but. Well, thanks very much for that. Um, we've got a few coming in online, so uh, if anyone else in the audience does have a question, put your hand up, but I will ask one or two from here. We've got one up in the back corner here if you want to get lined up for that. Um, Maybe just a quite quick answers to these, we've only got a few minutes left. This from Nicola C. Ross, has the film made you feel differently about the story and Daisy as a character? Um, I suppose maybe it maybe makes me feel like she's more of a real person because she's actually been played by someone. Um, yeah, like, instead of just being like a figment of my imagination, now she's actually been played by someone in something like someone that like obviously Laura's had obviously it's a shame she can't be here to, to talk about it but obviously she's had to come up with ideas for the character so it kind of doesn't just belong to me anymore um which is quite uh, interesting so yeah it's kind of like <coughs> giving away the character to, and to, to Neve as well um so that was a bit of a strange one that was a bit of a strange experience but it's quite cool to see how other people um you know 
portray the portray a character that you came up with, but they have got like their own take on it. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've got the, a question just up here, and I've got one or two more here. That I'm going to try and rattle through quite a few <laughs> before we finish up. Um, so just here in the studio. Uh, hi, Ross. Um, I was wondering how you got into writing books. Like, how you started. Yeah, um, so it was, it was, I did um, some, some creative writing modules um, during my English degree at Stirling University, um, and those went okay, and... I ended up going back and doing a master's in creative writing, um, which sort of gave me the, the time to write my first book. Um, but saying that, like, I definitely don't think, it, like, it's definitely not a necessity. Um, you know, you don't have to, if your writing's good enough, you don't have to have a, like, a master's or anything like, and to be honest, I don't think, I don't think any publisher or agent is actually going to check, like, you could just say you've done a master's and just <laughs> choose, a, choose a university and choose a random year and just, are they going to, are they going to ask to see your certificate? Probably not. Um, but no, so it's just, it's just a case of just, just trying to crack, just cracking on and, um, yeah, you don't, you don't need to have any qualification or anything. Um, some of the best writers out there never went to university or anything like, so, um, yeah, it's just a case of, of just getting the, getting the, getting your book done. Um, that's the, the best advice I can give is even if you think it's rubbish just get it to the end and then you can start redrafting it and then you can start sending it out um, but yeah it's just a case of I guess one of the great le leveler of writing is that in some ways that um, obviously there are barriers obviously but you know as long as you've got like a pen and paper or you know a laptop or something you can just you can just crack on there's nothing to stop you writing a book so um, yeah hopefully, hopefully if the writing's good enough um, you should be able to find someone who wants to wants to publish it for you. Does it get easier the more novels you publish or is it sort of like starting again every time from, from the beginning? Um, I guess maybe a little bit easier each time. Um, well, maybe not each time. Like I'm, I'm, well, I shouldn't say I'm struggling. I'm, I've never found writing to be particularly fun. I don't sit down and go, oh, this is great, fun. <laughs> I'd rather be doing this than anything else. Um, but I guess yeah, it, your, your confidence builds, you know, um, once you get published, because it's like a, it's, you know, it's like someone else saying, you know, your writing is, is worthy of being read. Um, so I guess that that's that's a huge part of it. Obviously, when and I guess when you're not published, it's, you know, you're writing and there's like, you know, there's like, I mean, there's still a good chance that no, like right now that I could write a book and it won't get published and no one will ever read it. But when you've never been published before, there is that sort of monkey on your back that's telling you you could spend. You know, months and years of your life writing this, and then no one could ever read it, which is pretty tough going. Um, so, when you get published, it does it does take that off a little bit. It takes a little bit of that pressure off that you, you know you've got more confidence that all in your writing and in the fact that someone might actually read it someday. Yeah, it kind of makes it more real in that way that you, you know it's got it's going to have a readership. I'm, I'm going to take one more online question, and I think we might have to wrap up after that. Um, and I'm asking this one because selfishly I had it on my own notes to ask you as well. So um, this is from LOL. And the question is, by the end of the book, uh, Daisy has impressed the upper management by how she relived the events uh, that she, you know, the, that she goes back through over those 16 days. Any thoughts on revisiting Daisy in another book? And I would say that there's a sort of hint towards the end that that could be possible. Yeah. Um like it's not a, it's probably not a very like literary answer, but I like to kind of leave all my books open at the end in case they become best sellers and, and I, can <laughs> make, I can make some money off a sequel. So um <laughs> yeah, no, I've definitely got I've definitely got some ideas and like a like a title in mind and that kind of thing. Um but yeah, it would just need to, it would need to be I would just need to see if, if people if people wanted to read it and of course if, if Neve was willing to direct um back to back first and second yeah for sure what, what do you think sure. a, a tv show sequel to the novel maybe absolutely call my agent and we can uh, <laughs> chat no 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 absolutely of course yeah well i think that's just about all we've got time for today thanks again uh, to to neve and to ross for for joining us and to all of you for coming both here physically in the studio and all of you who are watching along at home 
Um, thanks also again to Sir Ewan and Lady Brown for the support of the Read in Scotland project. It's been a, a really innovative and exciting programme that we've been able to run this year at the Book Festival. And you can catch up on all six of the Read in Scotland events, all of which feature an author and a filmmaker in conversation uh, with a, a film premiere, as you've seen today. Um, and thanks to, to the Scottish Government's Edinburgh Festival's Expo Fund for also helping to make this all possible. Daisy on the Outer Line is available to buy right now from the Festival Bookshop, which if you're physically here is just outside in the courtyard <laughs> um, in the old fire station if you head out through the front doors. Um, and it's also available to buy. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, it's also available to buy from our online Festival Bookshop. All of the money that is spent <laughs> on... <laughs> all of the money that is spent on books and any donations that you make to the to the festival all go towards supporting us being able to do projects like this in future and we might well be able to welcome Ross back to to talk about a sequel to this book or indeed just his next book in future so I think that's that's all we have time for can I ask you all to give a huge huge round of applause to Ross Sayers and Neve McKeown Thank you.